Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Back in 2014, Mark Ronson and Bruno Mars released Uptown Funk, the lead single off Ronson's album Uptown Special, and it was an immediate hit. At one point in the UK, it even broke the record for most streams in a single week, which was previously held by Uptown Funk. It broke its own record. Twice, actually. Even outside the UK, the song was everywhere, and the interesting thing is, it kind of felt like it always had been. Uptown Funk didn't feel like a song from the mid-2010s. It had this retro sound that made it seem almost displaced in time, like Ronson and Mars had discovered a long-forgotten gem from an earlier musical era. How'd they do that? Let's take it apart. The song starts like this. And let's be honest, that vocal line is like 90% of Uptown Funk's musical identity. That's not meant as an insult towards the rest of it, there's a lot more to this song and I'll get to all that, but when you think of Uptown Funk, you think of this part first. It's just so cool, you know? But how does it work? Well, let's start with the notes, cause that's the easy part. We're pretty clearly in D, so we start on the root, jump up to the fourth, then slide down to flat three and repeat. This is one of the most classic blues licks of all time, but with a twist. Usually the flat three is treated as a passing note, a way of transitioning between the more important fourth and root notes like this. But here it's given a much more prominent position, elevating it to a structural note in its own right, and I think this makes the whole song feel a bit more fun. You see, in a minor key, the flat three is the root of what's called the relative major, which is the major scale that has all the same notes as the minor one you're actually using, so leaning on the flat three, especially in such a low voice, implies a bit of that tonality. We're not in major, of course, but we're in the brightest part of minor. But that's just notes. What really makes this line pop is the rhythm. If we zoom in on the three-note cell it's built on, we find an absolute massive masterclass in funk rhythm. The G in the middle occurs on the downbeat, but it's actually the least important note in the line. It's just there to provide context for the other two, which demonstrate two different kinds of syncopation. We start with an eighth note pickup on D, and end with a sixteenth note anticipation on F. Eighth note syncopation is generally smoother, while sixteenth note syncopation is more abrupt, so the complete pattern has this constant push-pull to it where we're promised the simple one and then we get blindsided by the funkier one over and over again. If the whole thing was eighth notes, Dope. It'd sound too safe, but with all sixteenths, it's too jagged. Alternating between them gives you a rhythm that's just right. After a bit of that, the guitar comes in, and again, the chords are pretty easy. It's one and four, a pretty classic vamp in a lot of different styles. Or okay, technically I'm not actually hearing D or G in these chord voicings. I think he's just playing what are called guide tones, which are the third and seventh of the chords, the two notes that most strongly define that chord's quality. There's no root, so on its own you could read these as an F power chord and then be diminished, but since the vocals fill in the roots when the chords change, I think that's a more useful way to analyze the progression. Harmonically, the only noteworthy thing is that the G chord is dominant when the four chord in minor is traditional minor, but when I say traditionally, I mean in the European tradition. In the blues tradition, dominant four chords are all over the place, and since this sort of funk is pretty heavily blues influenced, I don't think there's really much of a mystery here. More interesting than the chords, though, is the register. The guitar is playing really high. This is, I think, an underappreciated part of arranging, especially in pop. Making music is all about controlling the way your audience experiences the sound, and a key component of that is giving them different kinds of sounds to experience. Up to now, we've had a vocal line sitting deep in the bass register, along with some percussive claps in the mid-range. So introducing a really high piercing line helps round out the spectrum and create a complete sonic landscape. This section has exactly three instruments, and it's spreading them out so you can really hear what each one is bringing to the table. Holding off on the highest part until halfway through the intro also helps build toward the verse, since higher frequencies tend to feel more energetic. Remember that, it'll come up again later. In the verse, though, everything changes. The vocal line drops out, as does the guitar, and we're left with a solo melody over a drum beat. The melody is joined by background vocals singing in unison. This shit that ice cold, Michelle. Although the album doesn't credit any background singers, so I think this is just Mars doubling the line in the studio. Not sure, though. Either way, it sounds like multiple people, which makes it feel loose and fun, like the musical version of a party. And the rhythm of the melody accents this. It's built on a pattern called a tracio, where you take eight beats and chop them up as evenly as possible into three pieces, 
But since 3 doesn't evenly divide 8, you're left with this slightly shorter note at the end, which gives it this lurching feel that makes it feel more alive. You get these little jolts of rhythmic energy every time the pattern repeats. In terms of notes, he's almost exclusively singing F, D, and C, outlining a shell voicing of D minor 7. A shell voicing is basically just a normal 7th chord played without a 5th, because the 5th isn't that important a note. The root defines the identity of the chord, and the guide tones define its quality, so there's really nothing left for the 5th to do, and you can pretty safely leave it out. Basically, this whole section is sitting on one chord, but since there's no harmonic instruments making that obvious, Mars is able to create motion with his voice instead, so you don't really mind that sense of harmonic stasis. This melody is a bit weird to me though, because when I listen to the section, it feels like it has a pretty significant range. The high notes feel like these big leaps, delivering an extra punch of melodic energy, even though, objectively speaking, they're not. The whole thing covers a range of a perfect fourth. Why does this happen? Well, I think it has to do with the tone of his voice. I won't get too far into vocal technique, because we'd be here forever, but basically, on those high Fs, Mars leans into more of a mixed voice, brightening his tone relative to the lower notes. This creates almost like an auditory illusion, tricking you into hearing the note is higher than it actually is, so Mars is able to sculpt a melody that pretty much anyone can sing along to, but that still sounds impressive, not because of the range, but because of the incredible control he has over his instrument. From there, we go into the pre-chorus, which breaks up into two parts. In the first one, the melody stays roughly the same, with some added call-and-response background vocals, I'm so hot. And we also bring back that bass vocal part from the intro. This time, though, it's further accented by Jomario Artis playing the same thing with a slap bass. We already talked about this part, so I'm not going to dwell on it here, but the extra weight of an actual bass is a nice touch. The other big change here is the addition of a guitar riff, which acts as another level of call and response, filling the gaps in the bass part. <laughs> It's a pretty simple riff, it's basically just C played over and over again in straight eighths. But why C? I think a less experienced arranger might have been tempted to use D, the root here, but instead Ronson chose to use the flat 7, which is, again, a guide tone, giving the line more color. He holds that D until the very end, hitting it with a 16th note anticipation that falls right before the bass comes back and takes over, like a handoff in a musical relay race. Over the course of the section, Mars's melody begins to spend more and more time on that high F, ramping up energy before suddenly dropping it in the the second half of the pre-chorus, where all the other instruments drop out and we're left with just a kick drum keeping time, and Mars with a new vocal melody. Girl said hallelujah. Note-wise, again, it's just C and D, with this high D accenting beat 4. Rhythmically, the Tresillo pattern is fading. We can see some remnants of it in the first half of the bar, depending on which one of these 16th notes you hear is the accented one. But after that, he switches to straight eighths. Why the sudden drop in intensity? Well, I think that becomes a lot more obvious when we look at how this part ends. There's a lot going on here, but if you really want to understand it, the best place to look is the synth part. This is what's known in the electronic music world as a riser because it, well, rises. As I mentioned earlier, higher frequencies tend to feel more energetic, so a riser is a great way to build tension and energy towards a big release. In EDM, you're building toward a drop, whereas here it's... Well, it's kind of a drop too, but I'd probably call it a chorus instead, because I'm old school. And we see this riser echoed in every instrument. The bass plays a walk-up, as do the background vocals. And since the drums don't really have that level of fine pitch control, Mars instead just ramps up the dynamics, hitting the snare harder and harder as it builds. This brings us to the chorus, which interestingly doesn't really feature much in the way of vocals, at least not lead vocals. Mars repeats the last line of the pre-chorus a couple times, but the spotlight has moved to the rest of the band. We have the bass vocal part back, again joined by Artis, and Ronson's guitar is playing the chords from the intro, but the clear lead here is the horn section. Want to guess what the notes are? Yeah, it's a D minor 7 shell voicing again. Using those same three notes ties it in with a vocal part so that even though we've switched instruments, it still feels like the main melody. But let's talk rhythm. We've got this four note phrase which is itself syncopated. It starts on the beat, but ends a 16th note before the next one, leaving you hanging with anticipation. If we look at where those phrases start, though, we see they begin on beat 1, the upbeat of beat 2, and then beat 4, which is another tresillo, just like the melody in the verse. This one's twice as long, and I'm not sure it's a real tresillo because they don't hit on beat 1 of the next bar, instead opting for another 8th note suspension. 
but you can still see the outline of that same pattern. It's like an homage, if you will. But let's come back to those missing lead vocals. In terms of lyrical structure, the chorus of a song usually exists to tell you how to feel about the story from the verses, so what does this lack of words tell us about the message of Uptown Funk? Well, I think it tells us there isn't a message, at least not one that lyrics would help with. The song is a party from start to finish, and the sheer joy it's trying to communicate doesn't really come across in words. Uptown Funk isn't so much a statement as it is a feeling, and that feeling is fun. The words are there to serve that purpose, and here the best thing they can do is stay out of the way so you can just let loose and dance. From there we go to the post-chorus, and the band switches to stop time, where they lay out while Mars is singing, and then all come in for some synchronized hits, again led by the horns. And I love this part because it's just using that bass rhythm again. I mean, not exactly. The horns are filling in the gaps, but they're still starting an eighth note before the beat and ending on the last sixteenth before the next one. Here, check out the two parts played together. <laughs> It fits perfectly. This time though, instead of emphasizing beats 1 and 3 like the bass does, it's centered on beat 4, part of the backbeat, which is where Mars sang those high vocal accents in the second half of the pre-chorus. The song is just so economical with its ideas, reusing them and reshaping them in so many different ways to make everything feel flawless and smooth. I love it. That builds up to a rhythm stop, which conveniently is on the word stop, and then we return to the verse and go through all that again, so I'm gonna skip ahead to the last new section of the song, the breakdown. Or, I mean, I say new, but again it's actually just a new combination of things we've already heard, and to be clear, that's not a bad thing. Being able to do this much stuff with just a few ideas is the sign of an incredibly talented songwriter. My hat is off to Ronson, Mars, and everyone else who worked on this. Anyway, the breakdown is kinda like an elaborated version of the intro. It starts with the bass vocals again, joined by artists, then Mars comes in with a lead part over it, but here his delivery has shifted to be pretty much spoken. Uptown, funk you up. Uptown, funk you up. This plays into the more relaxed vibe of the section with its stripped-back orchestration, and the accelerating rhythm throughout the phrase practically begs you to chant along. As he gets more into it, Ronson's guitar comes back, and then suddenly Mars jumps right back to singing in order to set up the return to the final chorus. It's honestly a little hard to find new things to say about this because so many of the ideas are reused from earlier in the song, so instead I'll just say this. If your ideas are good enough and you're clever enough to use them in different ways, there's no limit to what you can make. This song is a testament to the power of good musical ideas and a perfect example of the absurd level of craft that goes into making a great pop song. Uptown Funk became a classic the moment it was released, not because it sounded like the things that came before it, but because it understood what that sound was for. And hey, thanks for watching. As always, this song was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. The poll to pick the next one goes up over there next week. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rockin'.